How about if uh, we start our class by going to your notebook, looking in your notebook at last week's class, and doing a, just a review, mental review, kind of put it in your mouth, fit, in, fit it in your lips, mentally getting adjusted, you know, in tune with what you were taught last week and rehearsing it. <clears throat> and then talking to your neighbor about it. What was it that we learned last week? Go ahead. Okay, uh, any comment? What did we learn last week? That's Eugene. Core relationships. Can you give a definition of that? Yes. Very good. Let's hold on to that. That's how we're going to go back to that. Very good. Uh, anybody else? Yes, Gary. Relationship Paul had with Timothy and also Titus. The sonship, we're studying the book of Titus. We are in chapter 2. All right, very good. Anybody else? Brian? Yes, okay. All right, let's make a point here. I think you know this, but I'm not sure, but it's worthwhile review. Covenant is just an agreement between two parties. How, and we have God the Trinity, three, and could they make an agreement between themselves? They can, and, and this agreement, has it happened? Has God made an agreement with himself? Yes, he, does anybody have scripture verses on that? Okay, anybody know scripture? That God made a covenant in, with himself. Uh, now, here's man, and a covenant made with man, God and man, that's another kind. There's a covenant where God makes a covenant with himself, and then there is a covenant that he makes with man. And, and there's two categories of those. But but the covenant that God made with Himself. Anybody know any scripture on that? Yeah. Yeah. Gen Genesis uh, fifteen, uh, when the animals were split in half, and darkness fell. <clears throat> Make sure we get it. Chapter 15, verse uh, 11, 10, to the end, 15, 10, Genesis 15, 10. It is the, as Brian mentioned here, uh, when Abraham fell asleep, he essentially is removed, he is not an element in the covenant. It's a unconditional, unilateral promise, one direction given to Abraham, and it's this category where God is giving to Abraham, and this is called unconditional. But he does make covenants that are conditional with man. And that is, as somebody mentioned here, if it's a condition. 
if you will obey me. Anybody know where that is in the Bible? If you will do what I say, if you will obey me, if you will you will keep my word if you will then this is then you will be blessed if you do not then you will be cursed okay what is it yes Deuteronomy. it's mosaic covenant it was the covenant of the law and it's you can read these conditions 28 Deuteronomy 28 to 30 28 29 30 very interesting, and I find it interesting because over the years I have been in some Holocaust museums. Uh, I've been in Poland, in Auschwitz. I've been at the crematorium. I've been on the train tracks. I've lived in Hungary. I know I can talk about uh, Jewish persecutions in World War II, and uh, I've, I am... Uh, amazed at what happened with the Jewish people. But in the, uh, the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, Israel, but nowhere have I seen any explanation for why this has happened. There is no, no de uh, definition, a theological definition, and I, I know the wound is so great and the pain is so great for the nation and the tragedy of the whole thing. And I think that they may even hesitate to, to, to say that this happened because they did not obey God. But this Deuteronomy 20 to 30, and maybe take some time and read these chapters and a ask yourself, is this not a description of the dispersion of Jewish people out of Israel at the time of Christ right after? I, I don't want to get off the point, but I, I can't help but um, I just want to clear it. I don't know, make, make uh, points here. <clears throat> I'm getting way off the subject, but uh, I want to show you something that if my computer here will, okay. Listen, this is very interesting. When Jesus was being crucified, he said, Weep not for me, but weep for who? Yourselves and your children. Why did he say it? And when did he say it? He said, 30, This was in 32 AD. Weep for you and your children, for if this is done in a green tree, what will happen in a dry? Matthew 24, he said, when they, he said, you see this building, not a stone will be upon another. They said, when will this happen? And he said, when uh, this generation, before this generation passes away. What is a generation in the Bible, years wise? Yes, 40 years. Why do we say one generation is 40 years? Biblically. Remember, the Bible explain its, explains itself. So when you have the word generation, where, how do we know it is 40? Because the Jews wandered in the wilderness for a generation, and that was 40 so when Jesus says a generation, this generation will not pass away until you see this happen. Now, what this, if you add it up, it's 72 AD. But what happened Be, before this, or very close to it, it was in 68, 69 AD, when, if you, we call this the city of Jerusalem, the Romans camped around it. They besieged it. No food, no, no in and out, no traffic. You could not go in and out. This is written by a historian by the name of Josephus. That means that people are starving to death in the city. They were even, when, when you are a family, when you are a mother or a father and you are starving to death, who dies first? Your children die first. What, when you are starving to death, what are you tempted to do? To eat them. 
that's amazing. But it's your survival. That happened two times in our, it is Lamentations. We read it there, and we also know it here at this time, that this is what happens. Secondly, when a Jew in the city of Jerusalem wanted to escape, they would, they would swallow a jewel or valuable metal, swallow it, and it sort of to pass through their body so that when they get through and somebody searches them or catches them, they cannot find it, and they will retrieve it later. Well, Roman soldiers, when the Jews were trying to get out of the city and they would catch them, they crucified them. There were 5,000 crosses on the hills around Jerusalem at one time, about 69 A.D., and the Romans, getting wind of this, would open their bellies up and search their intestines for valuable, like a stone or gold or something. It was a slaughter. Horrible. What did Jesus say? Don't weep for me, but for you and your children. Because if this is done when I am here, and what will happen when you are rejecting me? I am your Messiah. This is severe. And I realize that Jewish people, they don't want to hear this from Gentiles because we Gentiles are looked to be the persecutor. We are the ones that are causing their trouble. We are the ones that could take these Bible verses and inflict pain on them, as happened in Europe. That we are not those kind of Christians that for political motivation or in deception, that we would like to, we live by God's grace in the Holy Spirit and understanding and what love is. So there's many heartaches amongst Jewish people regarding these things, but I'm just saying, read Deuteronomy 28, 29, 30. It says, you'll be so afraid that you will be Afraid at the shaking of a leaf. In the morning you will wish it was night. At night you will wish it was morning. I will scatter you all over the earth. And at the time when this happened, by 70 AD, the temple was burned. The gold melted in the temple, ran in between the stones. So the Romans, wanting the gold, took the stones apart and were digging for the gold. They plowed the city and planted a cornfield there. They devastated the city. And Jewish people, there was a law, a Roman law, 133 A.D., where no Jew was allowed in the city of Jerusalem. And for oh, 1,900 years, they were scattered all over the world. They went everywhere, just like Deuteronomy says. If you read this after you hear what we're saying tonight, it'll click. It'll help you understand what this Mosaic Covenant is. It's a, an agreement. It's a one. It's God is saying to the Jewish people these things, and it's conditional. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, I think we, we, uh, uh, covenant, um, between God and himself, we didn't cover that, it's Hebrews 6, would you turn there with me, please, Hebrews 6. Verse 16, men indeed swear by a greater than themselves with them in all disputes, the oath taken for confirmation is final, sending, ending strife. Accordingly, God also, in his desire to show more convincingly 
and beyond doubt to those who are to inherit the promise, the unchangeableness of his purpose and plan intervened, mediated with an oath. Okay, this oath, 15 and 16, there are two things that he said to Abraham. A son and land. You have a son. We have that number in Genesis 12, 3, Genesis 15, Genesis 17, and land, Genesis 13. <clears throat> and he, in effect, this is God saying to himself, and making the promise to Abraham unconditionally, this is what I'm going to do. This promise is at the heart of our Bible. It's the story of God's faithfulness and uh, what he promised regarding Abraham, he is doing, and now regarding us, and eternal life he is doing as well. And this is, I am not a Jew, as far as I know, even though Pastor Ben said there are people with my name in Israel that are Jewish, but I'm so happy that I'm a child of God. That's what we all love and rejoice in. But uh, what was I saying? We, yeah, we are, we, are, we are Gentiles that in Titus 1-2, it says, God before the foundation of the world promised eternal life to us. And all the promises that are in him, but the condition in regards to receiving it is our choice so we have the, the free will of the believer and us deciding. Once we decide to believe in Christ and all of these unconditional promises are given to us and we are sure and it's guaranteed that we are inheritors of the promises and they cannot be, they cannot be changed they cannot fall to the ground. They cannot fail in any way. All right, so we, 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 we are now looking at our leadership class, and we are um, uh, in Titus chapter 2. So would you turn there, please? I'd like you to take a few minutes and read chapter 2 and verses 1 through 2. Um, seven. Titus two verses one to seven. Okay, in a in a word, what is it? What is it saying? These verses. Yes. Behave yourself. Okay. Who's he talking to? Paul is writing to Titus. And he is saying, to Titus in chapter 1, he is to go to Crete, and he is to put things in order, and then he is teaching him, he's saying to Titus what he should do for the leadership in the island of Crete in their development as leaders, their practices, their mentality, their attitude toward what's, the, what's going on, what it is that they're doing. And you see one of the key here is the seriousness and the word gravity is, the, is really the, um, in verse 2, uh, urge the older men to be temperate, venerable in the Amplified, uh, grave in the King James, uh, to be serious, the word gravity in English, you know, when you have 
is center of gravity, uh, the, the, the weight, and a person to be, to have some weight in their life regarding what is important, uh, not to be so light, everything is a joke, my conversation, my purpose in life, everything I'm doing. But there needs to be a sense of great respect for God and for what he is saying and our mission, that people need to be led in a seriousness in what we're doing. At the same time, if you are with us, we have a good time, we talk, we're lighthearted, we're thankful, we have a lot of joy. At the same time, it is, Jesus said in John 12, 24 to 26, that if we lose our life, we will gain it. This is at the very heart of the ministry, because um, if we live our life based on our uh, <clears throat> culture, okay, here's a short list. Build your life based on our culture, our prejudices and biases, human wisdom, our opinion, or political persuasion, then we're really removing ourselves from the primary source of ministry, and it is really death to self. It's our death to our own life that God anoints and empowers us with his mind and with his perspective. I remember when we were in Finland back 1975, when we went there in 76, Pastor Mati came to visit a meeting and he you know, had his own opinion about American people and uh, it wasn't so positive. And when he heard Americans are in Finland and he was invited to come to a meeting, he came with a critical attitude. And he was sitting there, and then like, he realized that this was more than just America or an American thing, but the Spirit of God was here. And then he got to know us a little bit, and then he just heard in our conversation that we didn't know anything about politics. Like, I had no political opinion. I had no social, like, a sense of, like, like social issues and causes and so on, you know. Because I was a young guy, and I wasn't taught that way. I was taught the way, you know, Dr. Stevens teaches us. And so we learned to die to ourselves and then to minister in the Holy Spirit. And it was the Holy Spirit that built the church in Finland. And really, people really didn't know, like, were we, like, for this political agenda or this one? And remember, we're living in a country that is bordering the Soviet Union in the time of the Cold War. And I remember people asking, you know, like, like there was some little talk here and there, and it was in a Soviet newspaper, actually, in Estonia, with my name that I worked for the CIA. <laughs> so it was in the atmosphere, you know, like CIA agents could be, you know, religious people in Finland, you know, and it, w it wouldn't be an impossibility. But if you got to know us, like we weren't those kind of people at all, but we would be very good actors or else we are very, very uninformed regarding or we are spiritually minded. Let's say another point about that. Naturally, you could grow up in your culture, in your subgroup with prejudices and biases about classes of people. Maybe you could, you could be a respecter of persons. 
you could think of maybe educated people, wealthy people, or some class of people based on your own personality and your own upbringing. But all of this has to be dealt with at the cross, a personal cross life, and that's John 12, 24 to 26. Because there has to be gravity in your life. Even now, like in our country, we have a lot of talking about Muslims and Christians and, you know, all of these things. And I also like those discussions. But I need to be careful that I don't put a people in a class because they are a Muslim in the same way in the United States earlier when we have the words Protestant and Catholic. In our ministry, we never grew up in our ministry talking in a derogatory way about Catholic people. But we reached a lot of Catholic people by not talking about them, not putting them in, a Catholic, in the Catholic group, and maybe in the same way with Muslim people, by not talking about them that way, but by ministering life to them, by loving them, by giving them words of wisdom, by having a mystical part of life and ministry that happens through death. And through death, we have life. That's what's needed. And at the backbone of Paul's words here, as he speaks to Titus about these people, let's start reading from verse 1. But as for you, teach what is fitting and becoming to sound doctrine. I love the previous class by Dr. Stevens on foundations, and he talked about personal relationships and just just to say that when you are at the center of a relationship and Jesus is not at the center, then, then you definitely could be thinking of control, and maybe you want to control a relationship. What are some of the ways that you control people or control a relationship? I can tell you, you know, like a few that come to my mind. How? You, you tell me first. Okay, money. Anybody else? You control a relation. How could you get somebody to do what you want them to do? Yeah. Manipulation. How about tear? You know what I don't like is crying. <laughs> it's very it's frightening to me. And somebody starts crying and saying, you know, you don't love me, you know. You know, you don't care about me. What's your initial reaction? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. What do you want me to do for you? What can I do to prove to you that I love you? Pastor said in the class that if you control a relationship, then it will never satisfy you. If this is how, I already know the story of a, of a man and woman in another country, and the woman wanted the man to propose to her, and they're standing by the seashore on a cliff, you know, and I mean, I can't believe this happened, but it was like, it sounds ridiculous, but the woman wanted him to propose to her so badly that she's saying, you know, I, I will jump off the cliff. I, will, I just cannot, you know, you, ha- you know, I am in great despair, you know. I'm going to commit suicide. And he's like thinking, what is he thinking? (laughs) Go ahead, go ahead. (laughs) If you live, I'll marry you. (laughs) I mean, that we know happens in the third grade. 
in the fifth grade, you know, in high school. But as we grow up, we realize that, you know, manipulating, controlling people is not satisfying. But what is needed is for me to, to bring Jesus at the center in me with Jesus at the center with God. And God satisfies us so that we can love. And when you love, it really is one direction. When God loves, he is loving and, and never failing, and it is one direction, and it is unconditional. And you're loving when you are not loved. You're loving when nobody cares. You are loving when nobody's giving. You're loving when... And this, this can only come, and the words used in this chapter are like very strong words about character and the character that is required in the ministry. Like, Pat, you should never hear from our leaders like these conditional manipulative statements. Like, for example, pastor could say, you know, I'm, he's a pastor of the church. He could say, you know, I, I don't like what's going on in this church. If you people don't change, I'm out of here. It's like people are like, okay, what grade are we in? <laughs> you know, is this third grade or fifth grade? I mean, th this is very immature. That he, he, could be, he, he should be saying to the people, teaching the people, I, we are, I, I want to be led by God in my next move. And if there is 40 years of rebellion, Moses could say, I'm out of here. Or he could go before God and say in Exodus chapter 33, God, if you don't go with me, I can't go. But if you go with me, I can go. And your peace go with me, I'll be okay. If you are God and you want me to be here and you want me to do this, then I can do this. But if you don't do this, I can't do it. And the Lord said, I'm going with you. That's Exodus 33. And you shall see my glory. Moses wanted the glory. Remember, he said the prayer. There's three or four words in that chapter. Here's a, a, a great hint. Read Exodus 33, and you'll see the word name. You'll see the word face. And you'll see the word glory in that chapter. And also the word peace. Great little, little great chapter for eating, you know, and thinking about it. <clears throat> okay. Let's go back to the text. Titus chapter 2. Verse 1, the character and right living that identify true Christians urge the older men to be temperate, venerable, sensible, self-controlled, sound in the faith, in the love, and in the steadfastness and patience of Christ. I can honestly say, when I, when I think about our church, I think about people like Bruce May. Uh, I think, you know, there's a lot of, excuse me, names that I could give. And the, what I love about these people is that they're just very solid in their faith and in their heart and attitude. And, and they just are there. No matter what, like Jim Beck here, Mike Williams, you know, Pastor Cooper, and the ladies, the whole list of women, uh, no doubt about it. But the older men have this stability, and, and you just know that no matter what happens, they know what they believe, and there is inside in their heart a, a conviction in their heart that comes from a relationship with God that produces a love that is not, does, is, does not fail. Verse 3, 
But the older women, similarly to be reverent and devout in their deportment. Now, this word deportment is a good word because it's more than just behavior, but it, there is spirit in it. There is a manner. There is a way of behavior. There is an attitude that the older women are, are of this deportment as becomes those engaged in sacred service, not slanderers or slaves to drink. You know, I want to just say this is a unique portion. A woman that starts to drink, and she is an alcoholic, and she cannot stop. And I mean, maybe you have met them in your life, but it's very sad, like when an older woman is an alcoholic, and the possibility of her changing is very, very small. God could do it, but they, get, they, they just cannot get out of it. Same with men, but older women drinking, like it's like it just can't happen. I mean, it's mentioned there, isn't it? And I, in experience, I'm just talking from experience, that there are, you know, women that are drinking and they just cannot stop. And uh, it's, it's a tragic thing. Verse 3. They cannot slander or be alcoholics. They are to give good counsel and be teachers of what is right and noble. Older women that are teaching, like Linda Shabelli teaching young moms, uh, uh, women, we, Michelle Benoit and the women in our church, Joni O'Neill, and the character and the wisdom and the, the, the ministry that they have is referred to here in their, in their lives. Verse 4, so that they will wisely train the young women to be sane and sober-minded, temperate, disciplined, to love their husbands and their children. Now, I find this to be unique portion of Scripture too, and I don't want to run over these verses without just making a simple note. That, that younger women, they could, they could become critical of their husbands. Let's say a 30-year-old woman, 35-year-old woman, 25, of course, younger than that, but 30... 30, 35, they can become critical of their husbands. And, and it just happens in the world and with their girlfriends and their attitude. And they can't get away from it. But they have a criticism that is in their heart because their husband has disappointed them. Another thing that I have noticed is that they compare their husband with another husband. And they, they just think, oh, that woman has a great husband I don't have. And what does this say? The older women who have already been through this and have a character of godliness, like in our diagram, who are living before God, have learned to love. Like, I, I always think of married life, like when you first get married, you're in love, and it is so easy and it's such a joy and usually and it can go your whole married life I've been very blessed in that way in my life but then there is also the need to learn love not to feel it but to learn love that's first Corinthians 13 love on our diagram it is the relationship through death to self you know, it's like, you don't have to please me. I am loving you. You are not, in your attitude, you can say, you don't have to be a perfect husband. I am learning to love you. The women in our church are helping me understand that love isn't just like how I feel, but it is how I am thinking. I am going to think like God thinks and live in love. Same in church life. It's all attitude. 
There is no like perfect place. It is learning love. You know, uh, I have uh, somebody was saying about uh, my daughter Bethany, who like just takes life and lives it, and she has this uh, attitude about everything. And they, you can, if you know her, you can think, oh, she's got everything, got it made. Like she's got every. I mean, she's happy. Why is she? Her family and everything. But if you knew like her life, you know that it is simply an attitude that she puts on. It's like an attitude that she has about life. Like instead of complaining, she's thankful. She's very thankful. Instead of like comparing or thinking how life should be, she just wants to live and walk with God. And I'm amazed at her and my other daughter, Amy, too. And I don't mind saying it, even though they are my family members, but it's really amazing to me. And Beth comes like to all the services and has an attitude and does all that she can. But you know, you wouldn't, you couldn't believe that the uh, behind the scenes is a nuclear disaster. <laughs> you know, behind the scenes is like any kind, all kinds of reasons to find yourself slipping into negativity, regret, unbelief, uh, complaining, all kinds of things, like all of us. But you can't tell it because she genuinely, in, in thinking and learning, has gotten it from her mother, maybe picked up a little bit from me, <laughs> maybe on a good day that I had. And for our church and learning to live in this life of faith. And I appreciate it. I think it's amazing. Okay. Verse uh, 4. Should we read it one more time? So that they will wisely train the young women. No, another point about that. Do we need the training? Do we need the training? You know, do we need the examples? Do we need the instruction? Yeah, we do. We, they, the older ones train the young ones to be sane and sober-minded, temperate, disciplined, and to love their husbands and their children. <clears throat> oh, I tell you, I'm so much a believer in Bible college. I am. I so much believe in it. I really do. I know you do. I mean, I so much love Bible college. I, I sat where you sat. It, it is constantly in my life. What I have learned in Bible college, I have carried it in my life. I'm so thankful for it, and I see what it is. It is so, so important, so important. Verse 5. We're going to take a break in a minute. To be self-controlled, chase, to be self-controlled and chase, okay? Let's stop there. Um, sexual desire. Um, self-controlled. How could this happen? Conviction. How, where does it come from? It's the Holy Spirit. With not self at the center. That sexual desire, it may, be, it may be there, but I cannot have it rule and reign in my life. If I do, it is a monster, and it will not let me alone. And that is why you have to develop patterns and thought patterns and ways of thinking that will not allow you to indulge in, in thoughts of fantasy and in a way of living that is just allowing yourself to be at the center. And so you, you say in Job, Job 31, I make a covenant with my eyes. Uh, that's one point. The second one, Matthew 5, 28, how I think about another woman honorably, I think of her in terms of her soul, 
for a spiritual life, her potential, her value as a person, with a lot of respect for, the per for another person in the most noble way. This is really what it's saying, that when I see a sister, when I see somebody in God's family, when I look at anybody, I want to see them in terms of a godly and their potential in a godly way. That's important. And I feel sorry for people that, that cheapen their life by some other way of thinking because you actually find greater value as you put upon people that honor and that value and you have this respect for them as, as God's people. Or, if they're not a believer, you have a lot of respect for them as somebody made in God's image. All right, verse 5. Self-controlled, chaste, homemakers, good-natured, kind-hearted, adapting and subordinating themselves to their husbands that the word of God may not be exposed to reproach, blasphemed, or discredited. There is a testimony in society the way a woman treats her husband, and as she treats her husband in an honorable way, it comes across in society. That, that couple... That woman would never say anything derogatory in a public setting about her husband. That husband would never say anything in a derogatory way about his wife. He would never make a joke about his wife. I do in my own sense of humor, but I have honor for my wife. We joke because that's the way we live with each other. We talk and stuff. And somebody could say maybe, you know, like, you know, you don't respect your wife. I've had people say that to me. You know, that, you know, it's like, oh, how could he treat his wife? You know, like she's in the meeting, and why doesn't he have her stand up and honor his wife? Why doesn't Pastor Schaller talk more about his wife and honor his wife and have her stand, sit in the place of special honor, honor his wife, and have her dressed up and the limousine pull up and put his wife in there? You know, why doesn't he do that? It's because my wife and I have our relationship that is edifying and is honorable. And I know my wife. I know what, she, what honor is. And that is superficial public display. That's short, in my opinion. For me, if we were to do that, that would be just, uh, uh, just not edifying. Because it doesn't, that doesn't build up the body. It may build up her ego, but that doesn't build up the body. Uh, we're not like that. She works in the nursery and doesn't want anybody to know about it. When she's sitting in the congregation, she doesn't want any attention. My wife is just like that. And that doesn't mean that a woman, this is a good point, pastors' wives are different. And not everybody is like my wife. Some are like that person. Some are like that person. And everybody can be, you can be who you are in God. And there is no need to fit in that category or that way. That's between, you know, that's with, with the work of God. But uh, uh, there should be, in verse 5, that the word of God may not be exposed, uh, may not be exposed to reproach, blasphemed, or discredited. So uh, it's beautiful to see a couple that really loves and respects each other in the deepest sense. I mean, I think about my wife in the morning, at night, during the day. We text back and forth. We're not big phone talkers. My wife is not a real like talker just to chat. We communicate. We, you know, I honor her. I make a plan. I have my ways of ministering to my wife, respecting her, and so on. And we have, when, when we are together and people are with us, they sense. And I'm just saying this, that Paul is saying to Titus that the older women are to teach the younger women 
to have this kind of love and respect for their husbands and their children. And it's written there. Isn't that amazing? So that the world will say, those people have something between them where there is love and respect. And in reality, gravity is in their heart and in their life. And they have a lot of fun. I mean, they can be really wild and create, do things, and, and they are very secure in their relationship. It's not like I've seen it. Like, you know, it's like there's like a relationship where the one, the, there's a, the, you know, it's like, you know, you know, it's like, you know, what, are we playing around? Let's get our bozo clown outfit on and have our hat and the rubber nose and everything and the Mickey Mouse ears. I mean, we cannot pretend. We are not playing around. If Jesus is real, then he's real. And there's liberty. And the woman feels it, the man feels it, and there's a real expression. And people say, I would like to be like them on the island of Crete. They say, I haven't heard that Christianity is amazing. The men and wives and the young women and the children and the community, it is real. When I'm with them, it's not like, okay, we've got to put on our uniform and come out and perform and do our thing, and then when we go back and we're just going to be, it, it isn't it. And you know that. So it's awesome when Jesus is at the center. All right, so that's it for this time. So go take a break for seven minutes or ten ten minutes, and then we'll start up.